been live on Facebook. All right, we are going live on Facebook and I will start this once I get a confirmation. Okay, we're live and here we go. Starting now. Okay, should I just start? Not yet, not yet. We're, we're gonna let the attendees fill in the room. Okay. So far. You'll tell me. <laughs> yes, I will. Hi everybody. Thank you for joining us. We'll get started in just a few minutes. Let's let everybody file in. Okay. All right. So, thanks for joining us this af this afternoon, everyone, for, uh, for the Metropolitan Parent Center's December Power Hour Lunch Series. Hola y gracias a todos por estar aquí con nosotros esta tarde. Uh, before we get started, I would like to give our wonderful interpreter, Ray Miranda, a chance to connect with our Spanish-speaking families in order to give some important instructions on how to connect with interpreting services. Antes de empezar, nuestro intérprete maravilloso, el señor Ray Miranda, va a explicar cómo uno se puede conectar con los servicios de interpretación simultánea que estamos brindando el día de hoy. Ray, por favor. Sí, gracias. Buenas tardes a todos y bienvenidos a esta sesión informativa. Eh, todos ustedes que quisieran escuchar esta presentación en español van a encontrar eh, al fondo de su pantalla un globo. Eh, al oprimir ese globo le da la oportunidad de escoger interpretación del inglés al español. Una vez que así lo hagan, escucharán la voz mía interpretando esta presentación del inglés al español para ustedes. Gracias, Ray. Thank you, Ray. You're welcome. All right. All right. Thanks again, everyone, for your time today. My name is JC Cortez, and I'm the Director of Training and Development here at Senor Diaz. Metropolitan Parent Center. We have a great presentation in store for you today, but before we get started, a few words on who we are. Synergia is a multi-service agency located in Manhattan that has been supporting New Yorkers with disabilities and their families for more than 40 years. We offer a rich source of information and training tailored for our parents, including parents whose primary language is not English or they themselves have special training needs. We help them participate effectively in their children's education and development, and we partner with professionals and policymakers to improve outcomes for all children with disabilities. Synergia, Spanish for Synergy, is one of New York City's three federally funded parent centers committed to serving people with disabilities and their families with an added focus on communities of color and the economically disadvantaged. Synergia creates innovative programs ranging from transitional housing for homeless families who have children with disabilities, community residences for adults with developmental disabilities, 
parenting classes and parenting and education advocacy training for parents of children with disabilities or who themselves are disabled parents of children with disabilities. Uh, there's a lot more behind it, truly, uh, but for now, we'll continue. Before our presenter gets started, we wanted to let you know that this will be broadcast live on our Facebook page. Please use either the, uh, for any questions you may have, please use either the chat or the Q&A box, uh, where we will be happy to respond to your questions and address them live towards the end. We will try to save all questions towards the end. Uh, we will, we might take a few in between. We'll see how that goes. But for now, let's get to our lovely presenter whom we're so excited to have with us today and truly honored, Dr. Lisa Schulman. Lisa Schulman, MD, is a graduate of Brown University and University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. She is board certified in pediatrics, developmental and behavioral pediatrics and neurodevelopmental disabilities. She is professor of pediatrics at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Dr. Schulman is the interim director of the Rose F. Kennedy Children's Evaluation and Rehabilitation Center at Montefiore and the director of autism services at the program. Dr. Schulman also directs the leadership education in neurodevelopmental and other disabilities grant through Maternal and Child Health Bureau. She is the principal investigator of the New York State SPARC grant through the Simons Foundation. From 2016 to 2019, she served as the Centers for Disease Control Act Early Ambassador to New York State. She currently serves on the Autism Executive Committee of the AAP Council on Children with Disabilities. Her clinical and research interests include early identification of autism, overcoming healthcare disparities in autism diagnosis, and follow-up of children with an early diagnosis of autism. And now without further ado, Dr. Schulman, please, thank you. Thank you, JC. Um, I'm excited to be here and to collaborate with this wonderful organization to present to you how they art. Other people enjoy reading novels and newspapers. I'm always drawn to reading what I like to study and what I do is flexible. So I'm reading this thing kind of hot off the press and it's shock full. Cool. Let's get started. First, it's very important in a talk like this for, for you to understand my disclosure and this applies to all talks or materials you read because in any biases I'm having in terms of Meaning, some people are paid by a pharmaceutical company or are paid by companies developing medical equipment or vaccine. You want to know that in advance. So, first, I want to report I have no financial disclosures. There's nothing I am receiving that will impact on the information I sent to you. But I am involved in research related to genetics of autism. And I will be talking about why we study the genetics of autism. Dr. Schulman, before you continue, it sounds like we're having some technical difficulties. Do you have a headset by chance? Um, I turned off a fan. Does that okay. help? That helps I don't completely. have a headset. Yeah, we hear you now. All right, sorry. sorry. All right, no worries. All right, and then my, you might want you might want to restate what you were just saying, um, and then yeah, go ahead. Thank you so okay. much. Sorry about that. Okay, so just to restate it quickly, whenever you get information, you do want to understand the source of that information. Are you getting biased or biased information for some reason? Sometimes organizations that pay individuals or let's say research that they do or medications that they're testing might give you information that's influenced by that. So the first thing I wanna assure you is I have no financial disclosures, but I do wanna tell you that I am a researcher involved with the Simons Foundation studying the causes of autism and I will be mentioning that. And then the last thing is my particular bias, which I'm an evidence-based practitioner. I am going to be speaking about things that have evidence. Okay, here's our outline of what we're gonna to cover today. First, I wanna to describe what I am, which is a developmental pediatrician. 
We're then gonna move on to why we're seeing so much more autism these days. I wanna bring you up to date in terms of what we know about what causes autisms, especially the very timely topic of do vaccines play a role? Is it genetic? And then I wanna give you information at the end about where we are in terms of medical treatments for autism. Okay. So as you heard, I have basically worked in the Bronx for 30 years at the Rose F. Kennedy Children's Evaluation and Rehabilitation Center. And with all those years, there's one observation that I make consistently, which is that people who come to this center, which is usually about 7,000 a year, come asking questions. What are some of those questions? They usually have a child in tow who they have referred or their pediatrician has referred. And the question is, does this child have a problem? How should we evaluate? What is this problem called? Does it have a name? What should we do about it? Are there medical treatments, educational therapy treatments? What does the future hold for my child? How can we help him or her have the best possible outcome? What is the chance my next child will have this problem? Why did this happen? I didn't use drugs. I did everything right. Did I cause it? So I wanna tell you what a developmental pediatrician is. So certain terms are synonyms. They all mean basically the same thing these days. A developmental pediatrician, a developmental behavioral pediatrician or a neurodevelopmental pediatrician and this is what I am. And basically, a developmental pediatrician is someone who has medical training and also educational and therapeutic training and sits at the threshold of two worlds that often don't combine, namely the medical world and the educational and therapeutic world. So I went to medical school. I did a pediatric internship and residency in New York City and understand how to treat children with significant medical problems and how to evaluate them. Then I got very interested in the outcomes of babies born prematurely. And I decided I wanted to understand the full range of developmental disabilities. And I came to the Bronx to do a three-year fellowship, which I viewed as an apprenticeship during which I worked with the giant team of medical and therapeutic and educational specialists involved in the care of children with developmental disabilities so that I could learn about everybody who impacts on the child and family of a child with a developmental disability or delay. And that puts me in a position to integrate this information across these two often very separate spheres with the goal of helping the child have the best outcome. So what roles do developmental pediatricians play? So often when you have a concern about your child's development, you are dealing with early intervention, committee on preschool special education, committee on special education to get the services they need. But the question of what is the problem? What is the diagnosis my child has that is leading to their needing these services and needing to their requiring perhaps special education. So that process of what is this called is called diagnostic clarification. What is this and what isn't this? Then there needs to be identification of medical problems that sometimes are contributing to clinical problems. And there's a medical workup into the etiology, what has caused this problem. Then in terms of therapies, there's medical feedback based on research that says the following treatments are effective versus the following treatments are not effective or may have harmful outcomes as well. Prognostic information, what does the future hold? How is my child progressing? Are they catching up over time? Should we be altering something to help them make more progress? And then inevitably advocacy, advocacy, advocacy. Is my child receiving everything they need? If they are not receiving what they need, how can we assure? 
How can we provide documentation that the child should receive additional or different services? Okay. All right, so why is the prevalence of autism increasing? Is the first topic we're gonna tackle. Okay. So it seems like every time we turn around, we hear that the prevalence of autism or autism spectrum disorder, I tend to use those terms interchangeably, has increased yet again. In fact, I was noticing as I was just going over <laughs> these slides that um, the prevalence has increased again since I last did the slides, which was only a few months ago. Um, prevalence rate capture the frequency of a condition in a population and are a measure of what's called disease burden. How big a problem is this? Is it becoming more of a problem over time or less of a problem? In terms of figuring out the prevalence and things that impact prevalence rates, we need to start with what is autism in 2020? because five years ago, the criteria were changed. And as we find out more and more about causes of autism, that also gets folded into the criteria. So the first thing I wanna iterate is that autism is a behavioral diagnosis. Making a diagnosis involves looking at a child's behavior, getting information from people who spend time with that child, parents, but also if the child attends daycare, school, has early intervention services. We want reports on that child's behavior across all those settings. There is no, when we say something's a behavioral diagnosis, it means there's no blood test, no MRI of the brain, no EEG looking at brain waves that makes this diagnosis. It is made solely on accurate observations regarding the child's behavior and often what are called behavioral instruments that help us organize our observations to determine if a certain set of criteria are met. Now over time, the behavioral criteria for autism and even the name of the condition have changed. And some of this is related to the increasing prevalence of autism. So the current criteria are laid out in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders number five. Before that was number four. Number five came out about five years ago now and there were significant changes from the previous version of the DSM. So here's a schemata of the current definition. Basically, anybody who meets a set of criteria I'm going to go through in a minute is given a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. There's one diagnosis. Previously, the purple boxes in front of you were diagnoses that were part of the previous diagnostic and statistical manual. So autism, Asperger's, PDDNOS, childhood disintegrative disorder. These were each separate diagnoses previously, but now if a child meets criteria, the child is referred to as having an autism spectrum disorder diagnosis. Overall, the diagnosis has become more narrow and includes mainly autism and Asperger's disorder from the previous criteria, but not PDD-NOS. Okay. So here are the specific criteria outlined in DSM-5 for autism spectrum disorder. When I say it has gotten narrower, the previous DSM-5, DSM did not have a minimum set of, rec of criteria that were required. But under DSM-5, these three social communication difficulties are required, all three of them. And it's an important reminder that autism is a social disorder. If there's no social problems, there's no autism. So how do we assess social communication? Deficits in social emotional reciprocity refer to the back and forth of conversation, but also for younger children, the back and forth of smiling, of making eye contact with each other, of playing games that go back and forth. Deficits in nonverbal communicative behavior refer to 
everything other than language, personal space, using gestures to communicate, and also eye contact. The third thing is in many ways the most important part of the reason why we need information from across settings. Is this set of challenges interfering with the developing and maintaining of relationships? <clears throat> is this a child who's having trouble forming relationships with peers um, or with grandma who he sees often? Is this a functional difficulty? The next four criteria, two out of these four criteria are required to have a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. Re repetitive speech, what's often called echolalia, repeating what others say or what movies say or favorite videos. Repetitive movements like hand flapping. Repetitive use of objects, lining things up as a preferred activity, opening and closing doors for long periods of time. The next is excessive rigidity or excessive adherence to routines, making routines where they don't exist. We have to always read these six books before I go to bed. We have to put on my pajamas in the following order. Um, these foods cannot touch. Then there's fixated interests. The child who really loves to talk about the subway system or Thomas the Tank Engine or the weather um, and talks about this topic, whether anyone is interested or in listening or not. And then for the first time ever, the criteria include being overly reactive or underreactive to sensory input. The children who cover their ears to sounds that are not bothering anyone else or who are constantly going to feel and touch um, and seek out certain sensory experiences. Okay, so a definition can impact on the prevalence of a condition. I, I read about this thing and experienced it myself when they said, well, you know what? They lowered the criteria for hypertension and suddenly 2 million more people had high blood pressure because the definition had changed. It changed because there was meaning in identifying that group of people. It can also change in the other direction, making criteria more stiff. Okay, so the autism epidemic. It was always the case in the past that autism was considered a very, very rare condition. In the 90s, when I came to learn about this specialty, autism was considered so rare that it impacted two to four out of 10,000 children. Basically, now we're dealing with a prevalence rate that's like 265 times that. But I will make the point that although it was always reported to be a very rare condition, a large center like the Kennedy Center always saw a lot of children with autism. What began to emerge in the early 2000s were various sites saying, you know, we are seeing a lot more children with autism than th that reported rare prevalence come and study us. And that became the beginning of this process of yearly or two time, uh, every two years reporting what the prevalence of autism is. Now the current prevalence by the CDC is one out of 54 children. Often the prevalence is calculated by looking at the number of children at eight years of age so that any kind of misdiagnosis or missed children will be captured hopefully by eight years. So why is the prevalence of autism increasing? I want to give you some explanations that are surely contributing to that, but we can't answer the question fully. So, the first is that there's greater public and professional awareness. So in the past, autism was not a familiar word to families. They would come here and say their child is not socializing or is not speaking as expected. And after our evaluation, when we sat with the family to go over the results and we told them that their child had autism, this was not a term that most of the families that we worked with in the Bronx had ever heard. 
it was so unfamiliar with them to them that we made like a cartoon sheet with all the kind of seemingly disconnected criteria for them to bring home to grandma and grandpa and other relatives who were asking why the child was not yet speaking because parents would leave here and be unable to exactly know what we had been speaking of. They'd often go home and say, oh, my child, they say my child is artistic. So we needed to educate about what the condition was called and what it was. Now, it is extremely common. In fact, it's our most common referral question that parents come seeking the diagnosis. They come asking, I want to find out if my child has autism. And then we evaluate them and 20% of the children referred with this concern do not have autism. The pendulum has so swung that we used to feel extremely sure that we were only seeing the tip of the iceberg of children with actual autism here. And now when you have children referred for a condition that they do not have, you kind of have a sense that we are missing fewer children, which is good. The changes in diagnostic criteria over time are also really important to think through. So when I said earlier that this is a behavioral diagnosis and that we use behavioral instruments to make the diagnosis, among them are usually in normal times, not during COVID, um, the ADOS or Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule or the ADIR, the CARS, the Childhood Autism Rating Scale. Many systems, including New York, require that a diagnostic instrument be utilized. And one of the things the diagnostic instruments did was that they defined social communication criteria of a milder nature through certain activities that highlighted, hmm, this children should be engaging in, like we said before, reciprocal interactions, but he is not initiating. He is only responding to me, but never initiating. And that's becomes kind of starting to define what does more mildly affected social impairment look like? What does it look like in a child who has normal cognition or is gifted intellectually? So the definition of milder criteria ends up kind of elongating and increasing the diagnostic group of individuals with autism, not inappropriately, but rather in many ways, highlighting the group of individuals with normal cognition who have significant social impairment impacting their functioning. And these individuals were not included in the past. In the past, almost everybody with autism had a co-occurring intellectual disability. And now almost half of individuals with autism have normal cognition. So it's clear that the behavioral instruments we're using are picking up children who were not picked up previously. It was not social communicative impairment of autism was not defined in the past for this group as it is now. But that's not the only way in which diagnostic criteria have changed things. It, there's, that's relating to the more mildly affected group, but diagnostic substitution is also impacting the prevalence of autism on the side of children who have more severe symptoms. So in the past, and even into the 90s, there was no educational category of autism as something on an IEP, um, something that would entitle a child to a special education program. There was mental retardation, learning disability, language impairment, but there was no category of autism. And as autism became something that was assessed with instruments, people were looking at individuals who had previously been diagnosed with mental retardation, namely very significant global delays, um, that then became called intellectual disability and asking, hmm, does this child also meet criteria for autism spectrum disorder? 
And so indeed that entire population of individuals with global delays is now looked at through the lens of, okay, we know this individual is learning very slowly, has very significant or milder delays, but the question is, do they also have autism spectrum disorder? And this was not a process that was ever carried out prior to the late 1990s, 2000s. And that's a large group of children as well. So more kids on the mild end with normal cognition, more kids on the severe end with co-occurring intellectual disability have again, surely increased the prevalence rate of autism. The wider availability of treatment services, namely more hours of therapy, smaller classes, insurance covering certain services, leads families to seek a diagnosis and to again, contribute to our sense that we're no longer just seeing the tip of the iceberg. Although there are some populations that are more likely to seek out that diagnosis and some populations that are less likely to seek out that diagnosis, contributing to healthcare disparities. Are there other things that could be contributing to the increasing prevalence? Absolutely. But these are the things we know are contributing. And this is a picture that captures, so um, this is when DSM-4 arose that was again, kind of vague. And that was the beginning of the increase in prevalence. And that is felt to have contributed. And that was why the DSM-5 was made more strict again with the required criteria. This graph captures that as autism is increasing in educational classification, other categories are decreasing, mental retardation and learning disability. And so there's some amount of diagnostic substitution going on where children who were previously called intellectual disability or mental retardation are being called autism and children who were previously called learning disabled are being called autism. Okay. All right, our next category that we're gonna tackle is what causes autism? Okay, so here's the simple answer. We know that autism comes from a, pro a set of processes that go on in the brain. That's where it starts. Presently in about 20% of children with an ASD diagnosis, through a medical evaluation, we can identify the cause. The process of identifying the cause involves looking for clues in the past medical history, developmental history, family history, on physical examination and medical workup. By the way, I actually forgot, I wanted to say something about what's going on during COVID about the diagnostic process that this is reminding me of. So um, the instruments I spoke of, the ADOS, the ADIR, also the CARS, require making good observations about social motivation and social capability. And when evaluators are evaluating children over telehealth, over a video screen or in person, but with masks on, there are concerns that you're not giving the child all the cues that the child needs to really be fully engaged and that we're not also able to necessarily interpret the child fully. So special adjustments have been needed to make autism diagnosis during this period um, because we don't wanna hold off on diagnoses that are clear because we don't wanna delay the child attaining the therapies that will help with outcome. And so sometimes you'll hear about other instruments. So for example, we use another instrument now that was developed specifically for use during this period by the same woman, Dr. Lord, who developed the ADOS and that's called the BOSA. Um, we need though to bring children in who have milder symptoms, who are not able to clearly be seen on the video screen or engaged on the video screen and that's why during this period of time, we are seeing children in person to carry out the CARS or the BOSA and do a, a medical examination. Okay, so I said that in 20% of cases, we can identify what the causes is. 
I want to give you some examples of what those are. So when a mother is pregnant with the child during pregnancy, that is a time when if the mother gets an infection, it can be transmitted to the child. And some of these conditions are known to create a number of medical problems. So for example, congenital rubella, which there is a vaccine for, um, leads if the mother does not have titers, is not immune to rubella and gets rubella during pregnancy, it often leads to hearing impairment, heart disease, and also what was previously called mental retardation, but now is called intellectual disability, generally with autism spectrum disorder. We're more likely to see this in children coming from other countries who did not get this vaccination but theoretically it is possible in a non-immunized mother who bears a child. Metabolic conditions can also cause autism. So when a baby is born in the newborn nursery, the baby has the heel pricked and drops of blood are put on a card that is called the metabolic screen, the newborn screen. And the reason that screening is done is because there are several conditions, actually more and more conditions that if identified immediately and treated, because there are medical treatments, will prevent the child having intellectual disability and autism. But if not treated Im immediately, by two years of age, the child will have severe profound developmental problems. So examples of these include congenital hypothyroidism or low thyroid. Identify this at birth, give the baby thyroid supplement and the baby will be fine. PKU, phenylketonuria. If the baby has this, they cannot metabolize milk, regular milk and other products and damaging substances built up. If they are identified early and put on a special diet, they will be fine. So this is an important category of conditions. There are other conditions that are less clear cut, but are sometimes contributing to autism. And so there are some clinical scenarios with some of the symptoms I laid out here that indicate that we need to have a metabolic workup on a child, a child who gets very, very sick and dehydrated over minor problems and often seizures. Teratogens refer to exposures often from the environment that impact development. There are some famous ones in, in history. One is thalidomide, which was a medication given to women who were experiencing threatened abortion. Um, and it was never approved in the United States, but in England, it caused a lot of very unusual um, birth defects hands attached to shoulders without arms and other very unusual things, but it also caused autism. It's part of the reason we have such a strong FDA in this country and why in many ways relevant again to today that they go through more testing and more exploration of potential side effects before things are approved like new vaccines for COVID. Um, Neurologic conditions such as brain abnormalities or seizures, specifically infantile spasms, can also significantly contribute to autism risk. Before I gave talks, I used to always go on this website that looked and listed new genetic syndromes associated with autism so I could be really up to date, but that became absolutely impossible since new ones are listed every single day. There was kind of a mission to find the autism gene in the past, which translated into find the many, many, many autism genes, the many syndromes that are associated with autism. These are often made in the setting where a child looks unusual, has unusual or what are called dysmorphic features, does not look like the parents, um, but there are many occasions where the child does not have unusual features, but with up-to-date genetic testing yields abnormalities in the genome. 
There are also risk factors for autism. And I've highlighted two big ones, which are prematurity. Babies born very premature are at significantly increased risk for autism and need to be very proactively monitored. And intellectual develop disability or significant developmental delays. A child who is having significant delays needs to be monitored for signs suggestive of co-occurring autism regularly, not just until 24 months when the screening instrument is done. Let's talk more about genetics. So I said at this point, we can identify 20% of children with autism, meaning we can't identify the cause of 80%. That said, genetics is felt to be a potent factor. Twin studies tell us whether something it has a big genetic basis. And they do that by comparing the concordance rate, meaning if one twin has a condition, in this case, autism, what is the likelihood the other twin has autism? And it compares the concordance rates for fraternal twins who have the same genetic material in common as siblings versus identical twins who really share the same exact genetic material. When the concordance rate is much higher for um, identical twins, that indicates there's a very strong genetic component. And that is the case for autism. The concordance rate for fraternal twins is five to 10%, which is the concordance rate or the likelihood that a family that has one child with autism will have a second child who also has autism. But for identical twins, there is nothing higher than this. This and schizophrenia are the two most genetic conditions known of. If one identical twin has autism, the likelihood the other twin will have autism is 90%. Although interestingly, they may not have the same exact profile. One may be more severe than the other, which speaks to kind of a second possible hit from an environmental event. But it is kind of important to recognize that, again, one of the most common questions I am asked by those many people who come in the doors asking questions is, I don't understand how you could say my child likely has this on a genetic basis. I don't have autism. My wife doesn't have autism. Our other children don't have autism. Um, and in that scenario, the most common explanation is that it is what is called a brand new mutation, a de novo mutation that occurred in the moment of conception and therefore won't be affecting other children in the family. So it's an important thing to pinpoint. So over time, we're understanding all this complexity about autism and what causes it. And it's complex. Okay. So autism symptomatology is a final common manifestation of some type of damage to the brain from many different etiologies. There's one, not one path. But there is a medical workup to try to get more information on this. So here's what we do when we are diagnosing a child with autism. We make sure their hearing is perfect. And that may not be easy. You have to get the child into the booth. You have to have the child wear headphones or we get less information. The child has to be taught a kind of game. So if they see a puppet dancing, they have to learn to kind of look at the puppet and that is paired with a hearing stimulus. So there is a way to test hearing in even very young children, children who can't speak, children who can't raise their hand and say they hear a sound. And it's very, very important to get clear hearing because that would point to another means of treatment if that is not the case. And every year we have two or three kids who come here and they come for concern of autism or delayed language and they are deaf. Genetic testing is also recommended for all children diagnosed with autism. Different testing is done in different clinical scenarios, different testing for boys and different testing for girls. Um, but these are important parts of the evaluation. Under the line are specific things that may be done in other clinical scenarios. But the point here is that there is a medical workup to help us understand what has caused autism and that sometimes points the way to other treatments we might not otherwise know. So for example, this condition P10, if the child has a large head, that condition is a cause of autism, but it also is associated with um, tumors. 
And so children who have this condition are monitored for tumors so that they can be picked up at the earliest possible point and treated before they become fully cancerous. Okay, I wanna include this slide to, because parents, again, along the lines of coming in with many questions, I call something the suitcase sign. When a family comes and they are pulling behind them a rolling suitcase that has many, many pieces of paper in it, often printed out off the internet with lab results of these sorts of things. Um, I came here for the medical treatment for autism. Here is the hair analysis that I got by sending a lock of my child's hair. Here's the trace elements that were in their baby tooth. Um, here's the yeast, that yeast overgrowth that was evidenced in their poop. Um, and here are the vitamin levels and the results of allergy testing. And the truth is none of these things is known to be causative of autism. These are theories that are not evidence-based, meaning none of these results are going to lead to treatments that will impact the results of the autism. Vaccinations, never more relevant. Okay, so I wanna quickly take you through this story because I, I know I don't have a lot of time. And if you have interest in it, I'm strongly recommending this book, Autism's False Prophets um, by Paul Offit, who is a major force in the vaccination, um, vaccine development over many, many years. He's not involved in the current COVID vaccine, but he was involved in the development of other vaccines, which I personally got because I had never had chickenpox, which is a very big problem for a doctor. Um, okay, so for the majority of children with autism, the cause is unknown. And again, everybody comes in with questions. You know, why does my child have autism? So there was an investigator, a doctor named Andrew Wakefield, um, a British GI doctor, who claimed in 1998 that he had found the cause of autism and that it was the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. And he reported in a very well-regarded journal called The Lancet, um, report on 11 children who had had the regressive form of autism where they gradually lost skills and became autistic and said that when he did a GI endoscopy and took biopsies, they had not cleared um, the measles portion of the vaccine and that had contributed to the autism. Now the way science works is that one person or a group of people report a finding and offer an explanation. The next group of scientists repeat that to show that it wasn't just kind of chance and replicate those findings and take it one step further. If things aren't able to be replicated, then they fall by the wayside. This was never able to be replicated. It later came to light that this doctor had falsified data, had done this study on children who were not, did not have autism, who attended his child's birthday party, a whole slew of things that the families who were um, the children's families had hired, um, had a plan to, uh, for a new vaccine and or bringing a lawsuit against vaccines and we're in line to inherit money or be paid for that. So what is very unusual is when this process became clear, the Lancet retracted the published study, meaning this is not accurate. This is not true. We do not stand behind this. And Wakefield's medical license was revoked, but the damage was done in the form of the public lost trust in vaccination. And that was in the late nineties and vaccination rates and a connection or a proposed connection between autism and vaccines was posited and has been very, very difficult to eradicate. There have been different types of vaccines that, or different aspects of vaccines that have been hypothesized as a cause of autism, including thimerosal, a mercury containing preservative. But again, there is no evidence that vaccines cause autism. And it's extremely important as we're going into this period of a brand new vaccine that we understand that. No young children at this point are going to be offered vaccination for COVID, but in cert at certain points, they will be. 
or it will be a shame that they aren't. And it's important to understand that autism is not caused by vaccines. But I do want to kind of talk for a few minutes about how we develop medical treatments for autism. Okay, so parents often come to the center expressing, you know, my child has this problem, it's rooted in his brain. We know something is biologically wrong, but everything I'm being offered for my child in terms of intervention relates to kind of educational therapies. Is there a medical treatment? And again, parents may be offered on the internet or by speaking to other parents and parent support groups, or when a celebrity goes on late night TV and says that a certain diet cured their child, what are called unproven treatments. And it's important to recognize that these are again, hypotheses. They are not proven despite many efforts to prove them. The power of unproven treatments circulating is, is very powerful. And I learned it regarding secretin one day in the late 90s, I, my center had just installed voicemail. I told you how long ago that really was. And I was trained in the use of voicemail before I left on a Friday. And when I got back on Monday morning, my phone told me that my voicemail was full. And I remember saying, that's ridiculous. Nobody even knows that I have voicemail. But I listened to the messages and it was full. One after another of the messages said the same things. I saw the 60 Minutes episode last night about a boy who was cured of his autism by an injection of secretin before a GI procedure, and I want to get it. Do you have it? How do I get it? And it was one after another after another like this. And there had been a segment that I hadn't seen on 60 Minutes that interviewed um, one mom whose child had had this amazing ability to speak after an injection of secretin. And it became such a national phenomenon that overnight there was like a black market for secretin and parents would pay anything. And so the FDA and the CDC stopped the studies that they were doing on causes of or treatments for autism and turned all of their attention to secretin. And it's the most well-studied thing on the face of the earth. And pretty much it is not effective. The child who had that unique response is still very much autistic. It is not without side effects of its own. It is a disproven treatment. CBD oil is hot now and being studied. I don't know what the results will show and if it will be helpful for some groups. We have a study going on in the building here and I try to stay in the loop. And there may be some groups of nonverbal, very severely impacted children for whom it is helpful. So what is research? It's how we figure out the answers to everything we've been talking about, causes of autism, treatments for autism. Um, it is researching is to investigate systematically so as to be able to draw conclusions and have new understanding, new information. Here are some diagnostic questions. You can do diagnostic research. Is there a problem? How should we evaluate it? What's the problem called? You can do treatment research. What should we do about this problem? Are there medical treatments, educational therapy treatments? Follow-up studies, what does the future hold for my child? How can we help him or her have the best outcome? And etiology research, what is the chance my next child will have this problem? Why did this happen and did I cause it? the answer almost always being no. Um, there's a long history of um, research that highlights how far we've come in the past couple hundred years. Um, the, you know, Hippocrates, who's considered the father of medicine, had a theory that all disease was caused by mis like imbalances of the four humors in the body, which sounds really crazy to us now. And in fact, it was because of this theory that George Washington basically died of strep throat. Um, but the first step to trying in trying to medically treat or cure a disease involves figuring out what is causing the disease, which part of the body is affected, how is it affected? And these hypotheses are developed relating 
to those questions and systematically tested. So we were saying autism is related to the brain. What is causing the disease? Okay. Um, so actually, I have a number of favorite medical discoveries that tell, remind me how far we have come in terms of our understanding of what causes problems. Um, when I was a resident, children born with what was considered an absent left ventricle of their heart died. Um, now those children get heart transplantations. HIV was a death sentence. Now it's a chronic illness. Hearing loss used to be treated with hearing aids, which didn't work for a lot of people with the most severe hearing loss. And now cochlear implants help those individuals hear. Folic acid basically nearly eliminated spina bifida. There have been tremendous advances in stroke treatment. Okay, but autism, intellectual disability, learning disability, they're not on the list, not yet. How do we move ahead in determining the causes and medical treatments for these conditions? So I'm gonna take you back to high school biology for a moment. What are proteins and genes? Proteins are large, complex molecules that play many critical roles in the body. Almost everything is mediated by proteins. Genes are the instructions which tell your body how to make all the proteins it needs to survive. So we each have 20,000 genes coding for more than 2 million proteins. So studying genetics is important because by identifying the abnormalities in the genes, we're identifying the abnormalities in the proteins. And then there's a path forward because sometimes um, artificial proteins are developed or ways around that process where the protein is malformed or created. But we kind of have a path um, I don't think we have time to show this video, but I'm going to ask JC to circulate it um, because it's on YouTube and it's about a little girl who's now a big girl who was treated for a storage disease. It's not autism, but it's something that people said would never be curable. And it followed this path. The abnormality was identified in the gene. The protein that it crafted or that it contributed to was identified a um, new, brand new protein was made that was artificial and she has it injected and she has not died. She is in fact quite well. Um, and that is the model we're looking for for most conditions these days with a genetic basis. Um, so the way forward, identification of the genes coding for the proteins that cause autism is the path forward to developing medical treatments for autism. And the way, you know, it used to be the case that research was done on a small um, number of white men. And that's why we don't know what the causes of heart disease are or what it looks like in women. Children were often excluded. People of different races and cultures were excluded. And individuals with developmental disabilities were explicitly excluded. But the bottom line is we are fighting. We want to include a wide range of everyone to understand the different genes that are causing autism. And that's why I'm a principal investigator and a big proponent of the Simons Foundation. This is a private foundation that has taken the lead in obtaining, analyzing, and cataloging genetic material on 50,000 individuals with autism to move ahead with this goal. So this is what contributing to research on autism looks like. You are, you sign up and you are sent a kit at home to collect your and your child with autism saliva. It is sent back, it is analyzed. If it is found to have a known abnormality, this is a sheet of the known abnormalities, genetic abnormalities that have been identified that account for 20% of individuals with autism, then you will have a choice, you'll be told, and you will have a choice of being connected with other families and researchers who research that particular abnormality. If no abnormality is found that is recognized at present, 
it stays in the database and every time a new abnormality is found, it is run again to kind of update and be iterative and figure out, oh no, this is causing it, which we've now had the experience with another um, genetic mutation of being able to say, yes, this is another one to put on the list. All samples shared with researchers are de-identified, meaning they do not have the ability to contact you. You would have to kind of opt in if that was something you wanted. And those are opportunities then for individuals who sometimes get the first opportunity for medical treatment, which may be years away. So it's an opportunity to contribute to our understanding of what causes autism. It gives you information eventually about what has caused autism for your child in an increasing number of children. And it's, it's investing in research to help us move ahead with autism. And again, um, we're gonna ask JC to circulate information about how to proceed. Um, if you want to participate in the SPARC program or want more information. The last thing I'm going to finish up with, and then I'll stay on for some questions, is um, how to refer to a center like mine. So again, I'm at the Rose F. Kennedy Children's Evaluation and Rehabilitation Center in the Bronx, where I'm the interim director. And I am always a little hesitant to say, everybody I talk to should come to the Kennedy Center. And so I'm going to stop a step before that to basically say, every child with a diagnosis of autism should be known to a medical provider, a medical system that is interested and expert in autism and does medical evaluations. That can include developmental pediatrician practicing in other settings, neurologists, some psychiatrists, psychologists who work as part of a multidisciplinary team. There are multiple groups, but we are a site here that sees 7,000 children in the Bronx. And I would say the type of child to refer to us is at one extreme or the other, a child who really has very significant problems and may need more intensive therapy, may need medication management, is not eating food, um, really needs more intensive input and the parent needs more support. The other end are children who have many strengths, often learning well, but they are not getting the social skill curriculum, the social instruction that they need to be able to be successful in their academic and ultimately work and life settings. To refer a child here, this is the phone number and this is the email. Okay, I think at this point I'm gonna open it up um, to any questions. I know that was a whirlwind, so I'm open to staying a, a little longer to answer questions. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Shulman. Wow, that was a very jammed in, uh, presentation, but very informative, very thorough. Uh, I know we're so thankful for it. The comments that have been coming through have been all of just how excellent this information has been uh, as, you've, as you've continued. So thank you for that. Uh, we do have a couple of questions really quick. Um, mm -hmm. One of the first one is, my seven-year-old's behavior is getting worse. It's not just verbal, but now physical. When he gets angry, he grabs arms, he throws and breaks things, and a few times puts his hands on someone's throat. I don't know what to do. Okay. Um, so first of all, of course, this is the craziest time in history and a very stressful time for everybody. Um, and um, a time when often behaviors are worse in everyone. <laughs> um, but what I, what I will say is, does if your child has limited language, limited ability to communicate, um, then what we usually say in that scenario, the first thing you want to make sure is that he is not uncomfortable. He is not in pain. He does not have a toothache. He does not have constipation. 
He does not have something like, you know, a headache, an ear infection, something that is serving to make him generally irritable. So the things that he could tolerate in the past, you know, are now setting him off. That's, that's just a rule of thumb in any child with limited communication. The next thing is that I know that it is hard to, that the, the routine that so many of our children with autism rely on is not in place or not in place as fully as it should be. Um, and that that is setting many children off. So kind of in terms of management at home, sticking to as much of a routine as possible, working with your child's teacher to understand um, what is going on with the behavior across settings, whether it's virtual or in person. And again, sticking as much to routines as possible because those are comforting. There is a, if the behavior is a problem in school, there's a type of evaluation that schools do um, where they have a behavioral specialist do a functional behavioral assessment to figure out if this set of behaviors is occurring with a certain set of antecedents or circumstances. And then using principles of applied behavioral analysis to change how it is dealt with to diminish the behavior. Um, this is something that a center like this can also help you with as can psychiatrists because we can try to connect you to additional therapy and determine whether this is something that a medication would also be helpful for if you would be interested. So it does require kind of being seen. Um, but your schools do have expertise, namely this functional behavioral assessment um, that are worth asking about. So that's an element of advocacy that you have in your control. Um, but I, I have heard this story many times and we have had many of our children with autism having behavioral problems who had not had before um, to this extent. Yeah. Thank well. you, Dr. Shulman. Uh, another question, what is your professional opinion of someone who has a diagnosis of autism, PDD-NOS or Asperger's under DSM-4 being grandfathered into an ASD diagnosis under DSM-5? So we actually did a study of this, you know, as DSM-5 was coming out. I mean, most of the individuals with Asperger's and many of the individuals with PDD do, don't, don't need to be grandfathered in. Looking at the criteria now and doing the types of behavioral assessments we do, they qualify. There are a group of individuals who had PDD NOS who do not qualify. And often years have gone by since the original evaluation and their condition is better characterized by other diagnoses. It's not that they do not warrant any diagnosis or any help, but that the set of services for autism may not be the main priority. And so the effort then is to kind of re-diagnose what is this individual's main diagnosis? Are they getting a program and supports relevant to address those? There are also many children that we see who have other conditions like ADHD um, or oppositional behaviors or anxiety who have social weaknesses. And I think one of the most important things for, for families to know is that there are, you know, just like kids go to school, they have a curriculum, like they have academic things that they're going to be taught this year, they're going to learn this year, they're going to have made progress this year, you know, in long division or, you know, reading. Um, there are such things as social curricula for kids who have weaknesses socially to say, we are going to progress by addressing these this year with the following strategies, with the following games to help the child gain insight and skills. But in order to get these services, the problem has to be named. So when children have social weaknesses that do not reach the level of autism, they still can qualify for other diagnoses such as social communication impairment or language impairment with pragmatic difficulties. And then it is important that their IEP capture that they need social goals 
And there's a role for advocacy in saying, how are these going to be addressed? Is this what the speech therapist is going to do with a partner, the psychologist? Are they not doing it? And is this something you want to get on the outside? But the bottom line is things need to be named in order to be addressed. And whether they are named autism, autism spectrum disorder, or social communication disorder, um, they are they lead the way to appropriate treatments. Um, so that's my answer, my long and convoluted answer to that question that we thought about a lot. Uh, hi, I work in early intervention. I have seen the special on Netflix relating to eating a ketogenic diet to eliminate the prevalence of autism. What are your thoughts on that? You know, it's, it's falling into the same category as, um, I'm going to go back a couple slides. Okay, so actually I don't, I don't have it on here, but a ketogenic diet, the first use of ketogenic diet that I ever heard of was for infantile spasms. So this type of seizure emerges in infancy and it was found by, and, and it often has a bad prognosis, meaning that children with that condition often develop um, more significant developmental problems that even if the seizures are gotten under control and the seizures often segue into other types of seizures. So it's kind of scary diagnosis. And it was found that one of the ways to treat it in some children was a ketogenic diet. And namely they were put on a diet where they were always kind of in ketosis. And they were, it was done in the hospital. It was done carefully. And for some group of children, it really helped with the seizures. Um, these days, kind of a version of the ketogenic diet of course is you know, kind of everywhere. People are doing it for health reasons and weight reasons and all, all these sorts of things. But to me, to me, it falls into a category of prove it. Okay, so I have no evidence. And, and evidence is not one or two or even five or six people saying, this cured my child. It is what is called a randomized controlled blinded study. And what that means is that two groups of children are randomly put into ketogenic or not ketogenic diet. They have the, they're matched so that they have the same level of autism, the same level of developmental delay to begin with at the same age. Um, then they are followed by somebody who does not know whether they're getting ketogenic diet or not over time to determine are they having a better, are the kids on the ketogenic diet having a better outcome with standardized measures that give numbers? And that's how we decide. That's how we move to the next stage of saying this is effective. And the reason I came to this slide is that everything on this slide is an evidence-based treatment for something, just not autism. And so like hyperbaric oxygen, there was a period of time and, and people still I know like own hyperbaric oxygen chambers in, in their homes. Okay, hyperbaric oxygen is the treatment for carbon monoxide poisoning. You have carbon monoxide poisoning, this is a life-saving intervention. Um, chelation, chelation for um, lead poisoning is a life-saving intervention. I have been involved in doing it in the acute situation of a child who ate a ton of lead chips on the windowsill all in one bunch and literally came in seizing in the middle of the night and his lead level was 50. Um, it was not consistent with life. He needed this emergent treatment and it was one of the scariest nights of my entire life giving him chelation, which in its own right has certain very significant risks. So hearing about people wanting to chelate their child, you know, for a theory that they have mercury poisoning that is not known to be associated with autism and a, lead le and a mercury level of one, um, no, that's not the right treatment for autism. It's the right treatment for lead poisoning. And everything here has that sort of category. And so I put the you know, the ketogenic diet on this list of unproven treatments. Mm. 
All right. Uh, my young adult child with autism started bedwetting. He was fully toilet trained for years. What can I do? Okay. So this is going to have some similarities to the answer I gave about the increase in aggression. First, you have to take him to the doctor and make sure that he does not have two, one of two things, a urinary tract infection um, or um, diabetes. Both of those are medical things that contribute to bedwetting. Um, and, and he should have a good physical examination as part of that. Um, if medically nothing is going on, then it is kind of a sign of distress. It's what we call secondary. Once we've ruled out the medical things, it's kind of a secondary process, a sign that he is in some sort of distress. Um, and so in general, we would kind of take a step back the way you would train a child who is much younger, but also kind of taking this at his intellectual and developmental level to talk through how he's feeling um, and what goes on at night with him. But there, you know, limit, you know, the, the basic things about how we train kids and, but being explicit with him because he is older and you want to help him and he probably is embarrassed also. Um, so limiting liquids after a certain hour, making sure he urinates before bed, um, getting him up in the night to urinate. Um, if he does wet the bed, it's not a punishment, but it's natural consequences that it's his job to strip the bed and put the sheets wherever you generally put them and help make the bed fresh so that you wanna work with his motivation, but also address what may be contributing to it emotionally by giving him a sense of control. Okay. What can I do if a child behaves well in school, but violent outside of school? Even the therapist outside of school recommend a, recommends for ABA. Okay. Um, my first question these days is to ask, you know, is school in person and the therapist working, you know, over telehealth? I mean, that whole kind of telehealth piece is needs to be understood. Kids with that profile, you want to do as much in person as, as possible and of course safe. Um, and then that kind of idea of as much, much, much consistency. So if these behaviors were to occur in school, how are they managed in school? You want to do everything the same way. You want to refer to them in the same way if this is a child who has a visual schedule at school about how time is spent, you want to develop a visual schedule at home. Sometimes, you know, there's like kind of a free floating anxiety that comes with kind of days and hours stretching ahead with not knowing what's going on, if anything. And so the idea here is to kind of understand what goes on in, in the setting where the child's being successful and replicate as much of it as possible at home and work with the teacher and the therapist at school to maybe brainstorm. Um, maybe they can send you the schedule, but I, I would make a schedule. I would have, you know, do, the, do homework to kind of have more activities if he has too much unstructured time. If it relates to the use and kind of almost addiction to devices, you are gonna have to limit it because that is a really common thing that's going on now is that our, our kids are really addicted to the devices. And so a lot of these events occur surrounding time to turn it off. And so you, you're going to need to revisit that and make sure all devices are turned off at, you know, that it's not like kind of a, a, a being on technology habit as much as we are going to be on, you can have the following hour for free time on the, the iPad, um, you can be on there for class, but other times you shut it off, you give it to mommy and you do not have it because this is its own problem. Mm. Hi, my son is four years old and he was diagnosed under early intervention. I feel that he is on the mild side of the autism spectrum. He just has some behaviors that are different compared to a typical developing child. He is currently 
He currently likes to be buying different kinds of animals. And if he sees one in the store, he will remember for weeks until he gets the object. Is this a common behavior in autism? Okay. So when I went through the criteria, I mean, listening to his strong passion about the animals, um, that may fit under one of the second bunch of criteria to have two out of four of to meet the criteria for autism um, or or not. <laughs> um, the, the whole kind of idea is autism is a social problem. So I want to hear how is he doing with his peers? Um, is he invited to, well, in normal times, is he invited to birthdays? Is he invited to um, have play dates? When he has a play date, you know, does he talk about the other kids in school? Do they call up and have a FaceTime play date? You know, uh, do they meet in the park? Because it's a social problem. And again, he's just the profile of child who he probably can be in a, a regular class or close to a regular class based on your description. But if he has social weaknesses, now is the age and time to make sure they are addressed, even if mild. Um, so he, he definitely, you know, he sounds like he has so many strengths and it feels not good sometimes to say, well, we're going to zero in on the, the weaknesses, but he's, he's a boy who, because of his many strengths, you really want to make sure that socially, if he wants to talk about those animals all the time, or he's so focused on it that he's not listening to the teacher in the front of the room, which animal he's going to buy next, that impacts his functioning. And this is a time to learn you know what, your friends don't want to talk or hear about those animals. Dr. Shulman, can you ask, uh, can you tell us what do the centers, what will they be doing with the genetic testing data? Will it be destroyed? Will it go into a database? Many families are reluctant to do that and there's no yeah. clear explanation to parents about what the difference will make with the genetic testing. You know, it's, it's a question this organization, SPARC, takes very seriously. And there are other um, protocols, genetic protocols that also take um, very seriously. The, the data is de-identified after, after it's given. So there is no name associated with it. It can't follow a child into, you know, the future in terms of work or insurance or Everything requires parental permission and signature to be passed on. Um, the idea of kind of what does the parent get out of it? Um, it's an investment in understanding the causes of autism over time. So that's why I used the example of the video that we didn't watch <laughs> to um, understand kind of the whole process from a child who really could speak to it about how this same process that Spark is carrying out with autism was before that carried out and is in the process still of being carried out for storage diseases. Um, and that type of disease had a very clear abnormality found in the genetics and that gene that had the mutation or genes that have the mutation generate a particular protein that they understand how that protein facilitates breakdown of things that are not supposed to be stored in the body. And they made an artificial protein and it worked. And so that's why this girl was able to be treated. And that's a model. And there are other things like that, but that was a good characterization of that. But that's a model going forward for how we will eventually treat autism medically. But I started the history so far back. I mean, you know, George Washington, they did not know that, you know, strep throat was caused by streptococcus. They were bleeding him all night and he, he literally bled out. There was no such thing as an antibiotic. Nobody knew what caused this. And, you know, there's been tremendous progress over the years, genetics more than anything. Um, in my lifetime. So, I mean, genetic testing quality has improved. So when I started my career, 
genetic testing. Ooh, look at the genes under the electron microscope and we'll count how many are there. Oh my goodness, one is missing. There's one too many. I mean, that was literally the level at which genetic testing was. So the only things that existed were like Down syndrome, trisomy 18, you had an extra gene or you were missing half a gene, you had Turner syndrome, uh, an extra Y. I mean, really that's what genetics was. Then the next generation said, hmm, if you can identify um, a particular syndrome because this gene causes that syndrome. We can test one at a time for that syndrome. Okay, well, that was labor intensive. Then the next one, and this is the current, what is paid for clinically by your insurance is what's called a microarray. And it picks up, instead of needing the whole chromosome to be missing, it picks up smaller, what are called micro duplications and deletions. The one that's being offered, you know, and that's gonna pick up more kids who, you know, or more individuals who have abnormalities. And that's why you hear so much about genetics now. Um, but what's being done now through research protocols like SPAR is able to pick up a typo in the genetic material. No missing <laughs> or extra mm. genes, but rather hmm, this base pair that's supposed to be, you know, a B is something else. And so as genetic testing improves, there's so much more information to be had. And it really is an explosion. And that's why there's 23andMe and all these other things, because now all of these things. Now, in terms of the, the precautions for anonymity, you know, and discretion and permission, um, the, the protocols, the genetic protocols here have a tremendous amount of um, protections, something that 23andMe or you know, Ancestry.com do not have. Um, so they're very, very, very different. Um, so okay. it, it's, it's not a concern I have um, regarding, but it is an understanding that, and, and what the SPARC seeks to set up is a research community, people understanding that they are contributing. Along the way, you get results, but to be honest, we still see have children see genetic specialists because those results can be slow in coming. Okay. Uh, just a note to our families, we will be sharing the information on how to become a part of the SPARC research that Dr. Schulman is a part of. Uh, and we will have that for you in our email to follow up in following up this uh, presentation once we're concluded. Uh, just a quick comment, uh, two things actually. One is, does your center uh, re receive um, Medicaid and yes. also uh, private insurance? Yes. Yes, so we, okay. we accept all forms of Medicaid and we have arrangements with most insurances. Um, Private insurances often will require a referral here by your primary care doctor and also may not always approve all the types of um, services we do. Okay, good to know. And then this was just a comment is that there's a growing fear that if an autism gene is identified that it will kind of restart or recreate a eugenics movement for expecting parents. Do you have any comments on that? Okay, so first I'm gonna remind you that there's no autism gene. <laughs> okay. Okay. There are many, 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 many genes. Okay. Um, but what I will say is I have definitely followed this concern. Um, and I it it is brought up most often by individuals who are high functioning with autism. Um, and who belong to what we refer to, and they refer to themselves as the neurodiversity movement, um, where rather than seeing autism as a disease or a condition, want to make sure and educate the world and communities that there's a wide range of diversity and normal. And I am in favor of that. Um, but I also follow many, many, many children with autism. And some have very significant impairment. And seeing 
that as something other than a problem is not in line with what the parents want, not in line with what society will provide to help this child grow into adulthood safely. And so I do think that this is a matter of differences of opinion. Um, so it's common. I, I have gone out to my waiting area to pick up my next patient and found that the person waiting for me there was a pregnant mom and her husband. And their question has been about, for example, Down syndrome. Um, I've been told that the baby I'm carrying has Down syndrome. I want to talk to you in advance about what that means. And I do think that there is parental choice. Um, autism one day and, and kind of mutations, genetic mutations one day, as we learn more and more, we'll be at a place where we will be able to say, this will lead to severe profound developmental problems. This will lead to milder problems um, or at least give parents feedback and information based on, again, the genetics of many, many children and individuals that will allow them to make informed decisions. Um, and that's gonna be a process. Mm. Last question. <laughs> Can a child who has autism eventually lose the diagnosis? Okay, so you could look up a paper I wrote on this topic and the answer is yes. Okay, about 8% of children diagnosed young as they get older, do not continue to meet the criteria. Um, there is a profile of children diagnosed young and a, a, who, who have language, who have cognitive strengths, um, who do not have significant unusual interests. Um, who have milder symptoms, basically, and who respond to intervention. There are many, many, many examples of children who improve over time. And while they may continue to have the diagnosis, it's that very diagnosis that gives them access and opportunity to the interventions that continue to support their areas of weakness. So we, I have many students now who are in college um, and you know, their parents would never have believed that was possible. I have children who started to speak at 16, um, again, where that did not seem possible. So um, I'm, I'm not an all or none thinker. The child in front of each of us is an individual and like we all have strengths and weaknesses, each child with autism will follow their own path. Diagnosis is important. Intervention that's matched to the child's needs is critical. And those are things that are within your reach. Just this last thing just came through. Uh, I've been following the speaker, Dr. Gaber Mate or Mate, who has a special interest in fetal development, childhood development, and trauma, and in their potential lifelong impacts on physical and mental health, including on autoimmune disease, cancer, autism, and ADHD. Are you familiar with this research and this doctor on stressed parenting and or environments? I'm familiar with kind of toxic stress and the whole concept of, of adverse childhood experiences impacting physical and mental health. I don't know the doctor's name, but that concept is certainly well known to me and very much in the news now. And we have a, a big program on that for children and parents who've had very severe stressors. Um, but it's unusual that those are the cause of autism. And so I want to make sure I've said that because um, I think some of the most difficult sessions I've had with parents have related to, did I cause this? And yes, 
a lot of these um, you know, toxic stress situations were not caused by the parent, the parent, his or herself experienced stress, but this idea that this may have contributed to this child's autism is, is unlikely. Um, and I, I don't see, I think it's important, parental mental health is very, very important, but carrying a burden of that level of stress related to that is, is not helpful to anyone. And I'll give two scenarios, if you have a few minutes, that seem relevant to this question. So one of the most dramatic scenarios I ever saw in my entire life um, regarding diagnosis of autism and stress of a sort was a child I saw at 19 months of age who had been referred to us for not speaking and concern of autism, you know, 20 years ago. And the story was that the parent worked as a home health aide for an elderly woman when she became pregnant. And the elderly woman said that as long as the, the baby was a good baby and wasn't noisy, she could continue to live in and maintain her job. So as soon as the baby was born, the mom, the home attendant, kind of set the baby up in front of the TV and went about her responsibilities as a home attendant. And the baby was very, very good. Um, when I saw the baby at 19 months, the baby was unrelated, meaning socially completely seemingly unaware. Um, but in the course of just kind of a couple of sessions with a therapist, we were kind of observing that the baby was responding. And it became clear that the baby kind of had had tremendous neglect on a certain level, not intentionally, but the baby did not have the stimulation needed to develop. And I remember the session where we gave this, this mom who cared tremendously um, the feedback that she should take a leave from her job and devote it to kind of coming to sessions and, and interacting with her toddler and no TV <laughs> and let's <laughs> turn this around. And this baby had a fantastic outcome. And the idea here was that was something that could be that information led to a change in how this child was parented that had a tremendous impact. It's an extreme situation, but sometimes we'll see milder situations where we say, you know what, there's more the parent needs to and can do for this child to have the best outcome. But that's not the case for severe autism. Um, another, yeah, I mean, Another scenario was genetics related, that I had a patient that I saw who was given, a was in foster care and was given a diagnosis of fetal alcohol syndrome. She had moderate intellectual disability and, and autism. And the mother, the biologic mother worked very, very hard and is amazing and, um, got her kids back, now they're adults, but with improved genetic testing, because the child had originally had normal genetic testing, with the ability to pick up smaller mutations or missing or this and that, the child had a genetic abnormality that clearly was causative of this entire scenario. This mom had been carrying on her back this idea that she had caused this child's problems by alcohol. And the day, the minute we gave her this information, it was like life changing for her. Um, and so, I mean, that's something, again, information is powerful. And it, clear cut information is so hard to find these days. <laughs> um, sometimes genetics offers that. Um, sometimes clinical scenarios are very, very clear cut and offer that. And many other things are very, very, very mushy. But I'm very, very careful to not blame parents for this. Autism is from the brain and it's largely genetic. And that doesn't mean you passed it on. It means something occurred in the moment of conception. 
And I just want that to be known. Thank you so much. Uh, final question. <laughs> what are your thoughts on fecal transplants for the treatment of autism? They belong on that slide <laughs> where I said these are unproven. <laughs> and in fact, there was a kid who died recently from this. So one of the main things I feel like I do in my position is parents come in with these sorts of questions and news articles and send me things <laughs> that they read about on the internet or an interview with someone. And I say, do you want to experiment on your child? Okay, if you choose you to, to experiment on your child, namely, we do not know that this is helpful. Please just make sure that everything you are doing is safe. Recognize that what you are doing is unproven. It is an experiment. I personally don't want to experiment on my kids, but if you want to experiment on your kid, understand what the risks are. Well, yes, very, very much so. All right, well, lastly, before we go, I just wanted to remind everyone here of what we do here at Synergia. We offer informative workshops like the one we've been able to enjoy today. Thank you so much, Dr. Schulman. We also do education advocacy assistance, individualized special education guidance with our bilingual English Spanish education specialist who can assist you. I'd also like to highlight our autism initiative program where you can access, you will have access to information on access and referrals and services for your loved one. Synergia also offers some OPWDD services. We invite you to take some time to learn more by taking the first step in connecting with our intake department, which you can call here at 212-643-2840, uh, Monday through Friday from nine to three at Eastern time. And you can also send us an email at intake at synergianny.org. Thank you so much, Dr. Schulman. Again, thank you, it was a great presentation. And uh, for our families, we will have a, another uh, webinar on Friday regarding transitioning from high school. Um, so if you'd like, uh, check out our calendar and you can find the information for, to, for registration there. And uh, if not, uh, we will also send a blast, I think on Friday. But uh, yes, please fill out the survey and let us know how we did and how we can improve or bring more topics that are important to you and all of us. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day. Stay safe and stay well. <laughs>